Uh, okay, so the first lecture today is from Professor Subham Sahai. Uh, he's an assistant professor at IIT Kanpur in our department. Before joining IIT Kanpur, he was in uh, UCSB and uh, as a postdoc, and he completed his PhD from IIT Delhi. Uh, so Subham, uh, we right now have uh, let's say around the, what 10 and uh, slowly the number will increase so maybe you can wait for a minute and then sure. we can continue sure sure yeah okay thanks come So it's already 2.34, so I'll begin the lecture. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Shubham Sahai from IIT Kanpur. So I would be talking about neuromorphic computing. How do we map neural networks to hardware? So this is just a small part of this entire huge field, which is called neuromorphic computing. So I'll be just taking this excerpt and kind of uh, going about it during this talk. So before, before I kind of get into, you know, the basics of neuromorphic computing or the intricate details of neuromorphic computing, let me talk about some recent news. So the first recent news was discovery of this cyclo-18 carbon. So this cyclo-18 carbon is nothing but an allotrop of carbon, which is similar to graphite or diamond. So it has got 18 carbon atoms arranged in the form of a ring with alternate single and triple bonds. Now it's like it's theoretical discovery dates back to late 1970s, but only with the advent of, you know, fabrication technology and all, it was kind of realized by a team from IBM Zurich and Oxford who synthesized it. Uh, what is so special about this cyclo-18 carbon? So the moment it was fabricated or synthesized, IEEE Spectrum comes up with an article saying that this unique carbon allotrop can offer part to neuromorphic computing. And how is that possible? So they told that these atoms here would kind of act like neurons and these bonds between these atoms would act like synapses. I don't know how that is possible, but this was just to give you a feel of how hot this topic is. So uh, the moment I actually uh, read through this article, 
a scene flashed across my mind, which is from the very famous uh, movie Three Idiots. So in Three Idiots, the moment Farhan Qureshi was born, his father stood him like took him up and said that my son will be an engineer. Similarly, here the moment this cyclotin carbon was kind of synthesized, the scientists told that okay, this would be used for neuromorphic computing. So that is the craze of this era. Uh, that is the craze of this area nowadays. So with this, let me talk about this transit chip. So the cycle in this video, it can kind of balance on its own. It can follow your instructions. It can turn left when you say it to turn left. It can even follow you when you're running and all. And this is not a scene from a sci-fi movie. So this was kind of developed in uh, Peking University, Beijing, and they named it the Kyanzek chip. So what it contains is, it contains several sensors, and there are four neuromorphic chips integrated on this bicycle in 28 nanometer process. So the throughput is very high. It's kind of 1.3 tera operations per second. However, if you look at its operating frequency, it's only 300 megahertz. So your GPUs, TPUs, and all these modern CPUs that you work with, they are having a frequency which is greater than three gigahertz, 4.1 gigahertz, at least more than 3.6 gigahertz to be precise. However, the operating frequency of this kind of chip was only 300 megahertz. And despite this, you can see that it is performing perfectly fine. So one of the characteristics of these neuromorphic chips is that they do not operate at frequencies which are really high, which are kind of comparable to your uh, GPU frequencies or TPU frequencies, or you know even your CPU frequencies. But still, uh, the applications that they have to perform, they do that very efficiently. So uh, I talked that there were four neuromorphic chips integrated in this kind of bicycle. So what were those four neuromorphic chips doing? So there was one dedicated chip for performing convolutional neural network which was used for image processing and object detection, which will be used for you know, this kind of uh, sensing, sensing human and uh, like running behind that. Then there was this neuromorphic chip, which was doing the CANN, which is continuous attractor neural network for target tracking. Then another uh, neuromorphic chip was there for this spiking neural network. So spiking neural networks are kind of most biorealistic kind of neural networks. Like, I mean, the cognition of this spiking neural network is very close as compared to your human brain. So it's most kind of uh, bio, like it's uh, most closely related to biology, this kind of uh, spiking neural network. And the last neuromorphic chip that they developed was performing this multi-layer perceptron, which was for altitude balance and direction control. This multi-layer perceptron is simply a classifier, which I'll discuss later as well. And let us look at the state of the art neuromorphic ICs that we have as of now. So there, there are several flavors of such neuromorphic ICs. So one flavor is entire CMOS neuromorphic processes, which kind of use your, your SRAMs and digital circuits. So the best example of that is your Intel LOIHI, which was kind of uh, fabricated two years ago. And then iMake recently in collaboration with Global Foundries in its 22 FDX technology came up with this iMake GF inference accelerator IC. And this was kind of last year, November, I guess. So apart from this, there is another flavor of this neuromorphic IC, which kind of combines your non-volatile memory along with your CMOS. They may be kind of integrated in 3D integration fashion, or you may have them uh, lying like on top of each other or close to each other. So there are several flavors even in that variety. So let us look at them. So one of them could be 1T1R based inference accelerator, which like which was kind of fabricated at UCSB and which I was a part of. Then another one could be this, uh, uh, 1T1R kind of architecture with digital core. And that is what was fabricated in the University of Michigan. Then IBM's True North was kind of the first neuromorphic chip coming out of a phase change memory device. And then we also have this option of HP dot product engine. So this is the dot product engine that is present in HP labs. So they have these three crossbars of non-volatile memory such as R ramps, and they have these peripheral circuitries, which is entirely CMOS. And with this, they were able to publish, I mean, around 20 to 25 nature communication papers. So, uh, and let us talk about the last flavor, which is kind of very, ex I would say exotic kind of thing because it employs a carbon nanotube or, you know, uh, 3D integration of carbon nanotubes. And on top of that, there would be R ramps, there, there would be some STTM ramps and all those things. So this was recently kind of uh, demonstrated in ISSCC by Stanford's uh, group, Professor Mitra and Professor Wong's group. So what it contains is at the lower tier or at the bottom level, you have uh, carbon nanotubes, which kind of acts like a CMOS circuit, peripheral circuit. On top of that, you have R ramps. And even on top of R ramps, you have STTM ram or magnetic memory kind of a layer. So this is kind of a 3D integrated uh, IC, 
which was kind of uh, demonstrated by this Stanford group. And this was used for hyperdimensional computing, which is also very close to the way brain computes. So now with this kind of introduction to the state of the art in neuromorphic ICs, let me just give you a brief overview of what is to be covered in this uh, lecture. So first, I would talk about this artificial intelligence revolution and the deep learning, which has been the driving force behind this artificial intelligence revolution. And these kind of form the basis for the kind of devices, circuits, and the systems that we developed here at IIT Kanpur. And then I'll talk about the need for non-monument computing systems. Then I'll briefly introduce what exactly is neuromorphic computing and what can you classify as neuromorphic. Then I'll discuss about the attempts to emulate the human brain. And in the last part of this talk, I would be discussing about resistive ramps the operating principle, and how do we map these neural networks onto this RM crossbar array or onto this memory arrays. And I would also talk about the training of neural networks and several hardware-aware hardware -aware training algorithms with which you can kind of train your neural networks directly on the hardware. So with this, I would conclude. So uh, needless to say, we are living in an era of artificial intelligence revolution. AI has got multiple applications, and as you can see, it has been increasing rapidly. If you look at the numbers for 2021, probably that would be exceeding 10,000. So the moment we think about artificial intelligence, the immediate question that arises is, has India missed the bus? Are we at par with the global efforts? So the answer is yes, we haven't missed the bus. We are at par with the global efforts. Even the Niti IO has got a special kind of scheme, which is called National Strategy for Artificial Intelligence, hashtag AI for all. Now, if you look closely around yourself, these AI systems have become part of your everyday life. So there are several voice assistants like, okay, Google, Cortana, Alexa, Siri, which you may have used. And then there are other camera filters like Snapchat and FaceApp, which you also may be using on a daily basis, or I don't know, uh, depending upon the person, they may be using it on a daily basis or something like that. So all the days have become a part of our everyday lives and their comebacks are really good. For instance, when I asked Siri why I'm still single, she just opened the front camera and that was it. So they are really intelligent. However, if you notice them carefully, what you'll observe is that these applications do not work without internet. Why so? Because still the processing is done on the clouds. So internet is required to kind of get the inputs from our end into your mobile phone, then transmit it onto the cloud. And then the cloud does all the processing and sends the result back to your mobile device to show the output. However, no processing is done on the mobile device. Why so? Because these are heavily you know, resource intensive applications and for achieving them in IoT or mobile device, what you require is a highly energy efficient and a highly area efficient neuromorphic processing engine. And why so? We'll discuss in the later slides. So uh, before I get into the details of non-monument computing systems and all, let me also talk about this deep learning, which has been the driving force behind this artificial intelligence. And I would just talk about this simple deep learning primitive, which is kind of called a classifier. So what this does is, depending upon the input image that this receives, it kind of classifies into a particular label or a category. So the nodes here that you see, the circles precisely that you see over here, they are called neurons. And the connection between the nodes are called synapses. So the basic function that any neural network, be it a deep neural network, or be it a convolutional neural network, or be it a recurrent neural network, the basic operation that is being performed in all these neural networks is simply the vector by matrix multiplication. So what happens is these inputs are kind of multiplied by the synaptic waves. And before sending it to the next neuron output, the neuron just performs a thresholding function. So what comes at the input of this neuron yi is nothing but the vector by matrix multiplication of input xi with you know, the weight matrix wij. So this input is multiplied by this weight, this input is multiplied by this weight, and then it is kind of accumulated at the input of this yi. What this yi does is it just performs a function like a ReLU, a TANH, a sigmoid, or a sinh function on this input, and then it transfers it to the next level of neurons. So here in this neural network, what you have is first layer is called the input layer and how you feed any input to it. So you take any image, then what you do is any image has got a, uh, in, any image has got several pixels and all those pixels are having different pixel intensities. So what people do is they kind of convert those pixel int intensities into some number and those numbers are fed into these neurons. 
so how many number of input neurons would be there as many as there are number of pixels and there is also something which is called bias which is used to kind of improve you know your neural network performance but we know we won't be discussing about those biases in this talk so let's say there are like uh, 400 pixels in this image of panda so we kind of calculate first the pixel intensity of each of these individual pixels convert that into some number and then feed it onto these neurons so if there are 400 pixels over here there would be 400 neurons in the input here so the functionality of these classifiers or any neural network is kind of embedded in terms of the weights so for, uh, till now i have been discussing how inputs are fed into this now let us discuss how these weights are configured so the efficiency of any of these deep uh, like deep learning primitive is kind of dependent upon the way you uh, choose these weights so how you choose these weights is uh, by that process which is called training so what you do first is you have something which is called your training set so in training set you know the image and you know the corresponding label so you know that this image belongs to a panda this image belongs to a human this image belongs to a tiger so during training what we do is first initialize these weights to some random value so we initialize all the weights to some random values and then we feed this image like pixel by pixel we feed these numbers on these input neurons then these would be multiplied by these weights synaptic weights and then these would come at the input of these this level of neuron then it will just perform a thresholding function and pass it to the next layer of neurons so when it passes any input that would be multiplied by you know the weight matrix over here and then it that would be kind of collected or accumulated at these neurons and what these neurons would do these neurons will again perform a, a kind of thresholding function like tanh and send it to the final label which is which will kind of give you the output so you present to it any input image for which you know the corresponding label let us say we presented a panda to this network and we looked at the label dash or whatever is coming out of the network then what we do is since we know that this image belong to panda we compare this label with this label dash that is coming from your uh, that is coming from your you know uh, output of your neural network and then we kind of form a cost function that is kind of telling you that uh, how close your label dash is to your label so that cost function can be a square mean square error function which is simple simply label minus label dash square by 2 it can be a log logistic function it can be anything and then what you do is you kind of tune these weights or you kind of change these weights to make this label as close to label dash as possible so you feed different images first you feed this uh, image of this panda you check the label dash you find out the cost function you tune these weights to reduce that cost function then you feed a human image you check out the label dash if the label dash is very different from human then you again you know tune your weights in such a way that the difference between the label dash and human kind of reduces so that is how you train it so this process is kind of uh, known as training there is a specific algorithm which is kind of called uh, back propagation which utilizes stochastic gradient descent and i'll be talking about that as well so as i told you the first thing that you do is you define a cost function which kind of tells you how much this output is kind of different from the output that you already know for instance how much this is like how much this label dash is uh, far from panda so we define a cost function which is kind of the mean squared error and then what you do is you kind of see that this cost is just a function of weights and biases so for time being let us just uh, remove these biases so your cost is just a function of biases you change your weights you change your weights and you are going to change your cost so if anything is just a, a kind of a function of two variables you can define its change or let's say this c is just a function of variable v1 and v2 so how can you define the change in this c so the change in this c by simple uh, linear uh, like algebra or i would say uh, simple linear law is uh, it's gradient of this cost with respect to one variable times the change in one change in the first variable plus the gradient in the cost with respect to the second variable times the change in the second variable or to generalize this the change in this variable c is nothing but the gradient of the c with respect to the variable times the change in that variable now these weights are those variables and this cost is c so if the cost is function of those variables i mean if the cost is function of those weights and if we change the weights in such a way that they are negative and proportional to the gradient of that cost with respect to the weight for instance here 
if you change your del v in such a way that it is negative in sign to the gradient of the cost and proportional to the magnitude you can ensure that your del c is always some negative value so what does what this effectively means is you change your weights such that the weights are negative and proportional to the gradient of the cost with respect to the weights if you change your weights in such a way then you will ensure that the change in the cost is always negative or your cost is always reducing so what this effectively what this gradient descent effectively does is for for instance if you see that this is the energy landscape of you know your uh, system and you have a ball rolling which has to roll down the hill what it does is at each point of time it kind of calculates the gradient value and wherever the gradient is maximum and negative that implies that there your acceleration would be the highest or the velocity would be highest and you know it would be going towards downhill so every system wants to kind of go to the minimum energy state and reduce its cost function whatever you call it so here also uh, it will kind of go in the direction of the maximum gradient and which is negative that is why it will go towards your uh, minimum or global minimum whatever it is so the basic rule for training is you change your weights in such a way that they are kind of negative uh, to the gradient of the cost with respect to the weights and their magnitude is kind of proportional to that gradient value okay so with this uh, what happens after this training process is you deploy your neural network on the field or wherever you want your uh, neural network to function and then what you do is you present to it an unknown image so till now we have been talking about the training set where you knew the uh, image and the corresponding category but now let us talk about the test set or any unknown image that that will be kind of shown to your uh, neural network and then what neural network does is it does this in operation which is called inference or forward pass so again what will happen is this image will kind of be transformed into several uh, pixel intensities those will be fed here and the weights which we have obtained from this training process will be embedded here in these matrices so these inputs will be multiplied by those weights then they will be kind of transformed by these neurons then again that will be multiplied by these weights then again they will be transformed by this neuron again multiplied by these weights and the at the output you will see something which will kind of be the category to which this image belongs to so here it classified me as panda because my network was not well trained so the blooper is uh, it identifies correct class only if it is trained properly only if you have correct uh, correct set of these weights which kind of have or give you you know the minimum value of this cost function and uh, to the best of my knowledge there are some networks which are more accurate than human beings for specific applications so uh, that is that is the beauty of this field another interesting point is if you look at the google's data center workload around 95% of the resources of the computational power is kind of consumed while doing these three tasks which are multi layer perceptrons long short term memory and convolutional neural networks so these three are kind of neural network applications and you see 95% of the total cost or the total operation of this google's data center workload goes in doing these applications so that is the importance that these applications have nowadays okay so uh, let me then talk about this curve which simply shows you so on the x axis you have the number of operation in giga operations so what is one operation one operation is simply one vector by matrix multiplication so these kind of are the uh, most common neural networks so vgt inception resnet these are kind of the most common neural networks that people use nowadays so this graph simply shows you that for performing one inference that is for classifying one image into a particular label these neural networks take around some 15 to 30 giga operations so just to classify one image as you know a panda or a human being or any other label this neural network will consume at least or this neural network will perform at least 30 into 10 power 9 vector by matrix multiplications so that is the level of resource intensive uh, kind of computations that this systems demand and apart from that the circle size simply tells you the number of parameters that is weights and all that you have to store in order to you know work around with this these kind of neural networks so you can see that for running this vgg you require at least 155 mega uh, parameters or 155 mega weights and you have to store those 155 mega weights somewhere so this is not only very compute intensive but it is also memory intensive so this field has developed not only because of you know uh, the developments in new algorithms or new data set but this field has developed just because we had you know uh, the computational capability 
to run these computationally intensive applications. For instance, this neural network field is not very new. There have been these neural networks since 1960s and all, but only after 1990s were we able to improve the accuracy for any meaningful application. And why, why so? Just because we didn't have this computational capability in the form of GPUs and all before 1990s to kind of run these applications. So, okay, with this, let me talk about these GPUs. So these GPUs like NVIDIA Turing, which is kind of the most advanced kind of GPU from uh, NVIDIA, they are having a von Neumann architecture similar to your CPUs. So what that means is your memory and processor are separate blocks. And every time you have to perform computation, you'll have to you know, access the memory. So every time you access the memory, you kind of incur a lot of power dissipation and you also uh, you know, uh, add to the latency of your system. So you, if you look at the number of operations that it performs, it requires a power which is kind of 36 watts. So this kind of 36 watts is something which cannot be delivered by your mobile battery, right? So the mobile batteries are hardly five, uh, say five volts to six volts and they cannot deliver you a 36 watt of power. So these kind of GPUs cannot be kind of, you know, uh, installed within your mobile systems. So what Google did was, it tried to kind of, you know, uh, minimize the distance between the processor and memory. And it came up with what is known as a TPU or a tensor processing unit. So what it did was, since this green represents the processing units and this gray represents the memory units, they tried to place this memories or cache memories as close to the ALU or arithmetic logical processing unit as possible. So they kind of, you know, tried to bring these memory and uh, processing powers together. With that, they were able to improve the number of operations that they could perform per second. But at the same time, the power could not be reduced further. Even 40 watts is something that you, you won't be able to use in your mobile phones. So what is the way ahead? So academia, this is where academia comes into picture, research comes into picture. So academia came up with several digital inference accelerators or application specific ICs. So there were several reports of these digital inference accelerators or neural network accelerators from MIT, from you know, uh, Seoul National University, from everywhere. Although, you know, these kind of digital inference accelerator ASICs utilize several schemes like uh, runtime power uh, scalability or, you know, sparse design and all those things. But still, if you look at the energy efficiency, it did not improve much as compared to your TPU. So the energy efficiency only increased by, let's say, 10 times, maximum of 10 times. However, the worst part is that these digital ASICs are not flexible. What I mean by flexibility? So if this kind of sticker is made for, you know, uh, for... Uh, accelerating CNNs, they cannot be used for accelerating ResNet or VGG or any other neural network. They're application specific. If it is made to accelerate only one application, it can't work well with the other application. And what you want in your mobile device is that the same device should be able to process your voice. It should be able to apply camera filters. It should be able to, you know, uh, even process your hand instructions, your gestures and all those things. So you want flexibility in your mobile phones as a part of consumer electronics. So these digital ASICs are very uh, kind of you know, primitive that way. They do not offer any flexibility. Then still, if you compare their energy efficiency with the, uh, with the human brain, it's like 10 per six times lower than that. So six orders of magnitude lower than that. And as I told you that this vector by matrix multiplication is the most common operation in all these neural networks. So if we can come up with some scheme, which kind of you know, accelerates this vector by matrix multiplication process, we would be able to accelerate everything, right? So that is the main goal or that is the main kind of agenda of this industry right now. So now with all this information, let me talk about this neuromorphic computing. So in our human brain, memory and processing are not two separate blocks, but they are uh, kind of coincident. They are like memory and processing is happening at the same place at the same time. So as you are going through this kind of talk, you are also able to process it and you're also able to retain some parts of it in your memory. Also, there are like 100 billion neurons and each neuron is connected to, let's say 100, 2000, several other neurons in neighborhood with the help of synapses. So there are like 100 trillion synapses in two liters of space, uh, which is kind of amazing. And the best part is it consumes only 20 watts of power, which is even less than this LED for performing a day's work. Can you imagine that? Another part of this human brain, which is really amazing is it does real time processing, even with ionic conduction mechanism. Why I say that that is amazing is because everything in this real world is kind of based on electron conduction. 
you turn on you would like put your mechanical switch on your bulb bulb starts glowing there are electrons which are flowing through that wire at the speed of light which you say and they are actually uh, following the relaxation transport but anyways so you say that the moment you turn this on since the electron speed is very high uh, you kind of get instantaneous glowing of that bulb however these ions as you may know only travel via process which is called diffusion so diffusion mechanism is way slow as compared to your uh, drift mechanism or even relaxation based mechanism so even with that kind of slow mechanism based on ions your brain is able to process everything real time and with such a great efficiency so what exactly is neuromorphic computing how will you classify anything as neuromorphic so neuromorphic simply means it is inspired from the brain so in neuromorphic computing people take some inspiration or they look at some of the principles of biology or how the brain of several organisms work and then based on their responses like olfactory response or you know your vision or something like that they take inspiration from that and then try to design vlsi circuits or systems or devices which can kind of mimic those things so it's like mimicking some principles of brain and not emulating the brain itself however there have been several attempts to even emulate to even emulate the brain so one of the major attempts was done in japan so this figure over here uh, like shows you the rickens k computer which is kind of the fourth largest supercomputer in the world as of now so let me brag about its computation capabilities so you have like 0.7 million processing floors you have 1.4 million gb of ram so this was kind of used for simulating 1% of brain that is 10 only 10 trillion synapses so just to simulate 1% of brain's activity it took 40 minutes to simulate just 1 second of 1% of brain's activity so if you extrapolate that it would take around 6.5 years to simulate one day of brain's behavior and not that to not the whole brain's behavior 1% of your brain's behavior one day of 1% of brain's behavior would take around 6.5 years on such a powerful supercomputer to work reason the reason is very simple that the brain is not digital it's pretty much analog and there is in memory processing these like uh, even this rickens k computer is kind of you know uh, uh, what should i say it's a non uh, it's a one human architecture where memory and processor are separate blocks unlike your human being uh, unlike your human brain where your memory and processor are at the same place so the inherent architecture is different and you cannot expect this architecture to perform as good as your human brain so what is the way forward so let us do it in the analog domain itself and how so with the help of these cross point arrays so how these cross point arrays look is it's something like this so you have these adjustable conductances or adjustable resistances in between these rows and columns so at the intersection of each of these rows and columns you'll have some of these adjustable conductances so here you have an intersection so you, you have this uh, g11 here you have an intersection so here you have this g21 here you have an in, uh, intersection so you have this g31 so there is a kind of cross point array now how we can do a uh, vector matrix multiplication with this so if you encode your inputs in terms of these voltages and these rows and if you encode your weights in terms of these conductance values then what happens is the current which flows through this is kind of v times g right v, v by r or v times g so here the ohms law kind of takes care of the multiplication and similarly the current flowing through this would be what it would be v in by g12 so the ohms law takes care of the multiplication and the kirchhoff's law takes care of the addition so all of these multiplied values are kind of you know getting accumulated at this input and the current flowing through this column is nothing but the vector by matrix multiplication that is the summation of these inputs multiplied by their respective conductances to which they are attached with so by just this simple kirchhoff's law and ohms law we were able to you know perform this vector by matrix multiplication and it is also a non one human architecture because your weights are kind of encoded or stored as these conductance values and you are performing computation here itself you are not kind of uh, kind of you know Uh, extracting these values onto a processor performing the processing in that processor and then uh, storing the value again onto these weights so what you are doing is you have the weights over here and you are even performing computation over here so that way your memory and processor are not two separate blocks here they are at the same place they are concurrent they are coincidental and therefore it's a non one human architecture 
However, the problem with this kind of architecture is that this is not new. I mean, uh, this was present or this was kind of invented by Professor Carver Mead of Caltech in 1980s itself. The reason why this was not very popular or the reason it did not grab much attention of you know, the scientific community is simply that these two terminal adjustable conductances were not there. So what are the properties that these adjustable conductances should have? First, they should show you different values of conductance or different values of resistances. And second, you should be able to tune these values to any particular uh, kind of desired value that you want. And third, these conductances should also store their values for a particular amount of time, which is typically 10 years in terms of industry standard. So why this cross point error was not very popular? Just because there were no efficient adjustable cross point devices, which can show you a memory of 10 years, which can be tuned to any particular state. Uh, being two terminal device, tuning it to a, any intermediate state is really difficult, but there should be a capability. And third, it should be adjustable. So uh, there were no such efficient cross point devices before, but with the advent of this memory in 2008, which my postdoc advisor kind of came up with while he was a postdoc at HP Labs, so with this advent of memristors, we were able to find out these cross point devices, which had adjustable conductances and which would also store those conductances for let's say 10 years. So in this talk, I will be focusing on one such memristor or one such memory device, which is called the resistive ramp. So uh, let me talk about this resistive ramp. So here I'll be showing you this passive flavor of this uh, resistive ramp. So even resistive ramps are available in two flavors. One is the passive and one is the active. So in the passive crossbar, what you have is, you have these horizontal lines, as you know, your horizontal or your top electrode, and these vertical lines as your bottom electrodes. So what exactly is RM? RM is nothing but a metal insulator metal or a min cap kind of a device, where there is a metal on top, there's a metal in between, uh, metal at the bottom, and an insulator is sandwiched between it and the state of this insulator can be changed or the resistance of this insulator can be changed just by the means of electrical pulses. So how you realize it in this passive crossbar is this top electrode platinum is kind of, you know, uh, the horizontal lines going in this direction and this bottom electrode, which is PT and TA, this is kind of these vertical lines going along the column direction. And where are these R ramps? So at the intersection of each of these horizontal line and a vertical ramp line, you have a R ramp. So let me like help you visualize that. So you have this horizontal electrode or the top electrode going in this direction. So this is your top electrode. And your bottom electrode is kind of coming out of your screen. So this is one bottom electrode. This is one bottom electrode. So where exactly you have these MIM structures? So you have these MIM structures at the intersection here and at the intersection here. In between, you don't have any MIM structure. So you have these R ramps at every point where you know your uh, horizontal and vertical lines are intersecting. Okay, so this is about R ramps. So as I told, the best part about these devices is that they exhibit tunable conductance state or different uh, conductance state and you can tune precisely to one of these conductance state. For instance, the device that I used to work with, it kind of showed 16 different conductance state in, you know, uh, micro Siemens range. So you had these resistance states, like ranging from two micro Siemens to 32 micro Siemens, and you could tune to, you know, each of these intermediate conductance states, and then they also uh, like retain their value. So here I tested them only for one second, but you can actually uh, see that they do not change their value, even if you go till 10 years. So it satisfies all those criteria which are required for, you know, that adjustable conductance in that cross point array device. So with this information, let me go ahead and discuss about this RMs in further more details. So as I told, it's just a metal insulator metal structure and they're available in two flavors. So I discussed about this passive crossbar just now. Let me talk about this one t one r or one transistor, one resistor kind of a configuration. So what happens in this 1T1R, which is shown here on the left, what you have is you have a transistor and on the drain of that MOSFET, you have this RM. So the drain electrode is kind of the bottom electrode of your RM device. Then there is a switching insulator and then there's this top electrode. So the advantage of this 1T1R is that 
the current through this RAM is kind of the same as the current through this MOSFET, and it can be controlled with the help of this gate electrode. However, here, if you see, these horizontal electrodes are kind of you know connected, and similarly, the vertical electrodes are also connected to the other RAMs. So here, the kind of control that you have on individual cells is pretty low. But here, just by you know working around with this gate electrode, or just by using this gate electrode as an adjustable tuning knob, you can have more precise control over this current flowing across this RM, which kind of dictates its conductance value or its resistance value. So tuning or programming this 1T1R is way easier as compared to programming your UC or your uh, passive crossbar arrays, yeah. which is also known as 0T1R. However, in terms of area. Since this is integrated on top of drain, so the effective area of this cell is same as the transistor area. However, here the effective area is kind of the area of this kind of device, which is very small. So people have already demonstrated one nanometer cross one nanometer RM devices. So it's the kind of highest density which we can get on any chip if you use this passive crossbar array, and that is why these are very promising in terms of density. The uh, density of this kind of flavor of 1T1R will be same as that of flash memories because even your flash memories are one transistor kind of structure. So that way it's not that advantageous. However, this passive crossbar is really advantageous. So let me talk about the mechanism. So what happens is initially you have this metal insulator metal structure, which kind of acts like a capacitor. So any capacitor won't flow, like won't allow you to flow a DC current, as you may know. But even the insulators have some very high resistance, but uh, that is also, I mean, they have some resistance. The insulators also have some resistances. So what people do is they first inject a lot of current on the stop electrode, or they apply a very high stress to the stop electrode of your uh, pristine state or virgin RM device. So this RM kind of acts like a Frankenstein monster. You pump in a lot of current, you apply a very high voltage, and then what happens is, a soft breakdown happens, and this process is called forming. Forming simply means that you have uh, you have kind of stressed your RM to achieve soft breakdown. So what happens during this soft breakdown is that there is this conductive filament layer which kind of connects your top electrode to your bottom electrode. Now this conductive filament layer can be composed of oxygen vacancies, that is O2 plus, or they can be composed of some ions, metal ions, if this electrode is something like silver, then this Ag plus ions may kind of migrate inside this and you may even have this uh, redox reactions and all those things taking place. But here I'm just talking about this HFOX kind of memories where you have these oxygen vacancies which kind of form the conductive filament between top electrode and bottom electrode. Now since there is something which is charged and which kind of connects your top electrode to your bottom electrode, the resistance between the top electrode and bottom electrode is very low. So you started with an insulator in between and now you have some kind of a sheet or a conduction filament which kind of connects your top electrode to the bottom electrode via a small resistance path. So the current that flows through here or uh, the kind of resistance that this device shows would be very low. And that is what we mean when you say it's in the low resistance state. So LRS simply means that there is a filament which kind of connects the top electrode to the bottom electrodes and through which the current can pass very easily. Now, since these are positive particles, now, if you apply a very high negative voltage on this top electrode, what you'll do is you kind of attract some of these positive particles towards this top electrode. So some of them will kind of move from this bottom electrode interface towards this top electrode interface. And in the way, they'll kind of expose somewhat this insulator, which was already there. Now, since there is nothing which connects your top electrode to bottom electrodes and there is an insulator in between, the resistance will increase significantly. And the device will go in something which is called as high resistance state. Now, if you apply again a positive voltage on top electrode, you can again force some of these vacancies from the top electrode to push or to go towards this bottom electrode. And once you do that, you kind of again form this conductive filament between the top electrode and the bottom electrode. So this process is called set. The reverse process from which we kind of dissolve this filament is called reset. And just by applying a voltage stress on the top electrode, you can switch your device from the low resistance to the high resistance state and vice versa. So that is the beauty of this. So you, just by you know uh, pumping it, forcing it and applying electrical stress, you can make this, uh, like you can make this Frankenstein's monster and you can actually uh, let it go into several states like low resistance state, high resistance state and all those things. So the best part is the filament growth and dissolution that is kind of leading to a resistance change that can be controlled by applied pulse magnitude and width. 
So just by working with electrical pulses, you can kind of tune it to several different values in between a minimum value and a maximum value. Now the advantages of RAMs, so as I told you, extremely scalable RAMs have already been exhibited. So here I mentioned three nanometer cross three nanometers, but there was a recent paper in which people have already demonstrated one nanometer cross one nanometer RAMs. Now, another part is that it can be tuned to any intermediate level inter in between the minimum state and the maximum state. So how that can be done? So there is a specific program verify algorithm which does that. So in that, what we do is we apply any programming pulse and then we apply a verify pulse just to read the state and just to assure whether we have reached the particular desired value or not. So let us see, let us say that we want to program my device conductance to this 15 micro semen. So here, you know, uh, this is the kind of current or the conductance can also be governed by the current. So at a particular constant voltage, which you have like 200 millivolts over here, the conductance is kind of proportional to your uh, current value. So let us say we want to kind of program our RM device to this current value. So what we do is, let us say if we start from this particular value, we want to apply a positive voltage. We will apply a positive voltage so that my device goes into your set state. Like we'll apply a positive voltage on the top electrode so that more of this oxygen vacancies are uh, like forced towards this bottom electrode and my resistance kind of reduces or my conductance increases. So what we do is we apply set pulse first. Let's say we apply a small set pulse. Then we verify or then we read the state to know, okay, that we have reached this point now. Then again, we apply a set pulse, which is of higher amplitude. So we reach somewhat higher conductance value. Again, we apply a higher pulse, even higher pulse. And then we reach this value, let's say. So we overshooted the value of 15 microamps and we reached a value which is higher than that. Now, if we want to reach to 15 microamps precisely, we'll have to you know, apply a negative voltage on this so that we kind of push some of these oxygen vacancy towards this top electrode and increase the resistance. So to increase the resistance or reduce the conductance, we kind of apply these reset pulses. And after application of each reset pulse, we kind of read the state of the device to make sure that we have achieved the particular uh, or desired conductance value. So this is kind of your read program verify algorithm, which people use not only for RMs, but also for flash memories and nearly all these kind of you know, emerging memory devices. Now, uh, I kind of, what I did here was, I kind of took this smiley face and then I kind of broke or kind of uh, distributed into several pixels. And each of these pixels have different pixel intensities. I kind of converted those pixel intensities into some resistance value. And then I programmed my 20 cross 20 crossbar to those resistance values or those conductance values. And you can see that I have been able to program this pattern very precisely onto my crossbar. Array. However, there is this mole on the face of this kind of smiley, which is not present here. And this mole is nothing but a device which was stuck in its off state and it was not working. So tuning, you can tune precisely or you can map any pattern onto this kind of RM crossbar, which is really helpful and about which we'll discuss later. I mean, uh, how exactly we map it and all those things. So any weight value can be like any weight value or any input value can be mapped in terms of the conductance states of this RM. That is the main message that I wanted to give you. Also these RM devices for each of these states, for each of these conductance states, they show a retention or the state doesn't change till 10 years or 20 years if you leave it like that. And also the switching is very fast. It shows something around nanosecond uh, value of switching. So it can also be used for high frequencies as well, but people don't go for high frequencies. Uh, reasons would become very clear. Now let us talk about the challenges with this RM devices. So there's a large variation in the set and threshold, reset threshold voltage. So what I mean by that is, so I told that during the set process, what happens is these vacancy kind of come here and the conduction filament connects your top electrode to bottom electrode. This is your set process. And in reset process, some of these vacancies are kind of pushed towards your top electrode and then you uncover an insulator and your resistance increases. So this is your reset process. So the thing is there is a particular voltage at which you know this set or reset happens. And that set or reset, that voltage at which this set or reset transition happens, that is called the set and reset threshold voltage. And that voltage is very different. I mean, for different devices in that array, it's really different. So you apply the same pulse to all the devices. Not all will go to set or reset state. Not all will switch. So it shows something which is called a probabilistic switching, which is detrimental for its applications such as memory or storage. Then there's a large 
RTM noise because you know these devices are very small. I mean, the insulator thickness is kind of let's say a maximum of 10 nanometers. So if its uh, thickness is only 10 nanometers, and if you have in, a trap in between somehow, then that trap will kind of capture electrons uh, like very easily. Uh, and then it can also emit those electrons via several mechanisms such as tunneling or trap assisted tunneling and that way the value of RTM that you have here is very high. Also there is this current fluctuation that you apply same voltage to this uh, kind of device every time but you won't see the same current. Why so? Because this dissolution or, or formation of this filament is a very probabilistic process. It's not very deterministic even if you apply same voltage here you will end up having different number of oxygen vacancies in this conduction filament. But this conduction filament may change in terms of its width, it may change in terms of its length, and also it may change in terms of its number. So here we have only shown one conduction filament, but there can be several conduction filaments across this device. And after application of each device, you don't know or you won't be able to predict what kind of conduction filament pattern is going to form inside the device. And that leads to a different kind of uh, current or current fluctuation in each cycle that you uh, expose your device to. So instead of looking at these variations as you know very problematic for any application, uh, we can also think of them as a benefit for hardware security applications where you kind of exploit them for uh, doing specific applications which require entropy source within your device, which is unimitable, uh, which is unavoidable and it's different in different devices. So as I told you that this switching threshold is different in different devices, not all devices will switch if you apply a voltage which is kind of uh, very close to the mean of this. So if you apply one volt, only you will see that these devices will switch, these devices won't switch. So 50% if you have a distribution such as this, 50% of your devices are not switching. So then that gives you a probabilistic kind of a switching distribution. And that can be exploited as a static entropy source for a physical unprovable function or a dynamic entropy source for a true random number generator. So instead of looking at these variabilities as bad or ugly, we can also you know, uh, exploit several other applications from them. And that is what people precisely do. Okay, so with this, let me come to the main part of this talk, which was on mapping these uh, neural networks onto these hardware. So first, let me talk about the neural network that we have in the picture. So it's a single layer neural network, which is also called the bilayer neural network, why so? Because it just has one input neuron layer and an output neuron layer. So the input neuron layer has got nine different binary images. I mean, the pixel of nine but different binary images and one bias. Let us for the uh, time being remove this bias from the picture. And here, what we are doing is called XC2 training. So what exactly is this XC2 training? So XC2 training simply means that you train this neural network into software by running some MATLAB code or Python code. You extracted the weights for which you know, your label minus label as square by two was minimum. And then you just use those weights you obtained from software while training and then program those weights into this hardware crossbar as weights. And then you just perform in inference. So it simply means that you are not performing training within the hardware, you are performing training on the software. You are extracting the pair of values of those weights, which are giving you the best performance. And then you're programming those weights in terms of conductance of crossbar. So that is what is mean by execute training. So the kind of training set here that we would be using is this three cross three image of Z, V and M. And just to make a set out of it or a training set, we have kind of removed one pixel or we have kind of uh, introduced an error of one pixel on in all these images, which are corresponding to a particular class. The class is Z, V, and N. So what we do is we kind of, once we get those weights from your uh, software simulation, we have to convert those weights into some conductances, which we have to now program onto our RM device. So how we convert that weights obtained from your software processing as your conductance so we perform a simple algorithm, which is GIJ is equals to GMIN, which is kind of the minimum value of the conductance shown by your RM, plus the value of weight multiplied by Gmax minus mini the GMIN, where your Gmax is the maximum conductance state that your uh, kind of RM can show. So just a sanity check, if your weight that you obtained from software is zero, the conductance that it should be programmed to would be GMIN. And if the weight that you obtained from your software is one, the value of G that it will be programmed to is Gmax or the maximum conductance state. Now the question arises is that 
your weights in software can be either negative or positive. So it can, like even the normalized weights will vary between minus one and one. However, your conductance in the circuits or in your, these elements is always positive. So how can we, you know, handle these negative weights? What can be done to handle these negative weights? So the answer is very simple. People go for this differential scheme. So what this differential scheme means is they kind of distribute this weight in software as two different weights, two different positive weights. First is Wij plus, which kind of represents the positive part of the weight. Second is this Wij minus, which kind of represents the negative part of the weight. So if Wij is kind of greater than Wij plus, then what you have is you have a negative Wij. So that is what happens. So now we similar to this, since we have kind of divided all of these weights at, as some sub weights, like positive sub weight and negative sub weight, we'll have current or vector by matrix multiplication corresponding to the positive part of the weights and corresponding to the negative part of the weights for the same value of input. And what would the final output? So the final output would be simple. The di difference between this positive summation minus this negative summation. So just by doing this, you can kind of uh, handle even the negative weights. And how can you do this? By a simple OPAM circuit, a simple differential, like uh, OPAM difference circuit or something like that. You can easily do this. The best part of this is that if you have some noise, which is kind of being injected into both these nodes, both these kind of columns, which are handling your positive part of the weight and the negative part of the weight, then this noise kind of gets cancelled out because of this differential scheme. So now with this information, let us look at how we are kind of mapping these conductance values or weights onto your crossbar. So let us say that this is the kind of crossbar and this is kind of your Mr. crossbar that I told already. So these are horizontal electrodes, which are your top electrodes and these vertical electrodes are kind of your bottom electrodes. So at the intersection of each of these horizontal and bottom electrode, you have RM, so you have the RM here, you have RM here, you have RM here, you have RM here, you have RM here, okay. So now how we kind of map these weights are, let's say I have weight 1, 1. So weight 1, 1 will have a positive part, weight 1, 1 plus and weight 1, 1 negative part. So the positive part of this would be converted to a conductance value using this, uh, use, using this kind of expression. Then that will be mapped to, or that will be tuned to the RM over here. Then the negative part that is G11 negative would be mapped over here. Similarly, G12 positive will be mapped here. G12 negative will be uh, mapped here. G13 positive to be mapped here. G13 negative to be mapped here and so on. So we performed software simulations. We extracted few weights. We converted those weights into two sub weights, one representing the positive part, one representing the negative part. And then we program those positive and negative sub weights onto these adjacent columns. And then how we apply the inputs so let us say we have to show a pattern Z. So as I told, first we have to convert it into some number and then that number into some input, right? So if the pixel is positive, if the pixel is black, we apply a positive voltage. If the pixel is white, we apply a negative voltage. Again, white pixel, a negative voltage. Black, 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 so three VRs. Then white, white, so two minus VRs. And then and then the black, so plus VR. So this is how we apply the inputs. We just color code it in such a way that you know a black pixel represents a positive read voltage a white pixel represents a negative read voltage once you do that what happens is this kind of once you have encode your inputs in terms of voltages and you have already encoded your weights in terms of the conductances of these rm devices so the current that flows through here will represent your positive part of the first neuron current that is i1 plus the current that flows through this column since you have stored all the negative sub weights in this column, this will represent the vector by matrix multiplication of the inputs with the negative weights because the same inputs are applied to all these you know, rows. So uh, this is how you can actually perform vector by matrix multiplication. And here, this column represents the positive part. This column represents the negative part of the first neuron weight. So the effective neuron current is I1 plus minus I1 minus, which you can easily obtain using OPAM. Similarly, these two, uh, these two columns represent neuron two output neuron and these two columns represent neuron three. So here, if you remember, there were three outputs, each corresponding to class of Z, class of V and class of N. 
So this I1 is kind of encoded by the first two columns. The I2 encodes the second label, I3 encodes the third label. So now with that, let me tell you how operation works. So if you present to this network, anything from class Z, like if you present any of these images, how you present these images, you just apply voltages corresponding to the individual pixels of these class. And then you look at the current, which is kind of being sunk by these different columns. So if you look at that, if you present to this network, any of the images from first class Z, you see that the neuron corresponding to class Z shows you the maximum output or the current through this I1 plus minus I1 minus that will show you the maximum value. Similarly, if you present to this network, any image from class V, you will see that the neuron that is I2 plus minus I2 minus that will be the highest current, which you can see even here. And if you present to this network, any image from this class of N, what you'll observe that this I3 plus minus I3 minus is kind of giving you the maximum current, which you can observe here. So this is how you can kind of, you know, train your network in software, but kind of demonstrate or kind of infer, perform the inference in hardware on the RM crossbar. And this is how you can, you know, map your neural network weights onto your hardware crossbar. Now, can we even uh, do complex neural networks? So let us try doing this neural network with one hidden layer. So what exactly is a hidden layer? So here you have input layer, which kind of takes in the direct color coded uh, inputs. Then you have these weights, and then you have something in between the input layer and output layer, which is called the hidden layer. So what this hidden layer does is it kind of simply helps you to learn more delicate features and it kind of improves your accuracy. The more number of hidden layer you have, the more deep your network is, and you know, the better the accuracy. It will saturate after something, but that is how uh, people usually kind of classify it. So here we have 16 inputs for a four cross four image of four different patterns, pattern A, T, V, and X. Also, since we have two weight matrix now, one corresponding to input, one connecting your input layer to the hidden layer, and another one connecting your hidden layer to your output layer. So you have two different weight matrices. So you'll have two different crossbars on which you'll map first the weights of this uh, matrix. Let's say you map it to this big crossbar and then the weight of these uh, matrix you kind of map onto this crossbar. So here you require as many crossbars as there are number of hidden layers or so as many crossbars as uh, the number of different weight matrices that you have in your neural network. So here also the training was performed ex situ. We kind of trained this network on software. We kind of found the weights and then we programmed those weights as conductance value in the crossbar. So this was the kind of setup that was used. So these are crossbar arrays. So this is first crossbar on which you store your input to hidden layer weights. This is the second crossbar in which you store your hidden layer to output weights. And these are you know, your analog switch matrix through which you can uniquely apply these plus VR or minus VR to the individual terminals of this crossbars. And this is kind of a custom, custom PC board that we developed for you know, uh, doing this kind of operation. So if you look at what, what is happening over here is, if you apply any input corresponding to this pattern A, you'll see that the neuron output or the current through this neuron is the highest, the first neuron. So here also you have this first neuron, which is kind of representing your class A, the second neuron is representing your class T, the third neuron is representing class V, and the fourth neuron is representing your class X. So you apply anything from class A, your first neuron is going giving you the highest output. You apply anything from pattern T, your second neuron is giving you the highest output. You apply anything from pattern V, your third neuron is giving you the highest output. However, if you apply anything from pattern X, you'll see that it's smeared. The output is kind of smeared with several different errors. So the kind of accuracy that we got with this was only 81.2%. And this is very low as compared to any of the software neural networks that you have. Like uh, on this kind of a small data set, the accuracy that any software kind of uh, neural network implementation will give you would be close to you know 99.8% or something around that. And if on that data set, your device is performing 81.2%, it's really poor as compared to the software. And I'll discuss later why, why is it so. The main reason behind this is the uh, variations. So that varia those variations are not very good even for neuromorphic computing application. However, just because these applications like deep neural networks and all can tolerate some amount of variation, people are still going ahead with this. 
Now let me talk about training as well. So till this point, we have been training about, we have been talking about this X to training where you train your networking software and then you kind of extract those values from software and tune your weights or conductances in hardware. And then you are doing everything. But now let us talk about training or how we can train these neural networks on the fly or how we can tune the, train these neural networks over the hardware itself. So this is kind of a basic operation, which is vector by matrix multiplication. So now let us talk about training. Let us talk about this neuron J in layer L of your neural network. So let's say this demo is sitting over here. So what would be the input of this neuron? That would be simply the vector by matrix multiplication of the previous layer. And the bias will be added, but let us for the time being just ignore this bias. So what happens is the input that comes to this neuron is simply the vector by matrix multiplication of the uh, weights, which are in the previous layer and the previous layer inputs. And then this neuron simply performs this thresholding function on this input and sends it to the next layer of neurons. So let us say that this uh, demon, which is sitting over here, is kind of a good demon and is trying to help us by changing this input to this neuron, yi. Let us say that the demon changes this input by, let's say, this del y i. So now the change in this cost, change in this cost by simple linear rule is gradient in the cost with respect to this uh, input of this neuron multiplied by the change in the input which this demon has done. Now we define this gradient of this cost with respect to the input as the error. Why so? Because if this gradient is kind of very large, then even if you change this input by a small amount, the change in the cost would be large. And we can say that our network was not very optimized. However, if you change this, if you if this gradient value is very small, even if you change this input by a very small by a very large amount, the overall change in this cost would be small, which would simply tell you that this cost was already optimal. And no matter how hard you try to change these inputs, your cost won't change much. So it's already close to its optimal value, and the error is less. So that is why heuristically, this gradient kind of gives you a sense of error. Now the gradient of the cost with respect to weights is simply the gradient with respect to the inputs multiplied by the gradient of input with respect to the weight. And that is simply equal to your error value multiplied by the previous input. So you have simply found out the gradient of the cost with respect to any weight. And that is simply equal to the error multiplied by your previous input. Now remember from our discussion on the stochastic gradient descent algorithm, that if you have to train these neural networks, what you do is you change your weights in such a way that their sign is negative to the gradient and the magnitude is proportional to the gradient. And this way you ensure that the cost is always reducing. So once you found the value of this gradient of cost with respect to the weight, which is simply your error multiplied by the input, you have to change this weights by amount which is negative of this value and proportional to this value. And if you are able to do that, you'll ensure that the cost function is always reducing or you're improving the accuracy of your neural network. So uh, as I told you, what, what you have to change now is you have to change the weights by an amount which is simply equal to you know, the product of your errors multiplied by the inputs. So there are several schemes which can be used for doing this training operation. One of them being this stochastic mode. So in stochastic mode, what people do is they calculate this change of weight for all the inputs that they provide to the end network. So what I mean by that is you have a neural network, you provide to it a particular training image, you calculate the label dash, and then you change your weight in such a way that you uh, have like, you change your weights to kind of tune your label dash as close to label as possible, just after application of a single input. In second mode, which is called the batch mode, what we do is, we kind of provide it. Hello. Uh, sir, it... uh, sorry for that. Uh, so, so in batch mode, what people do is they kind of present all the inputs consecutively. So the, they have this training set. For instance, I had the image of this tiger. I had the image of this panda. I had the image of everything there. So consecutively, I apply all these images and then I do not change the weights after application of each image. But what I do is I kind of accumulate the value of errors and inputs that I calculate. And at the end of all, at the end, that is when all these images have been shown to the network, then I change the weight. So that is known as this batch mode. 
So again, another method which is very easy or which people generally use is called Manhattan rule or resilient propagation. So what that means is people simply say that calculation of this error as well as this product of this error and inputs in your hardware is a very complex process. So for each application of input, you have to calculate these errors. You have to calculate the product of this error and this input. And then what you have to do is, then you have to change the weight corresponding to this value which you have calculated. So calculation of this value requires a peripheral circuitry. It increases your area overhead, it increases your energy. So what people propose is, instead of looking at the exact value of this error and uh, product of the error and your input, let us look at the sign of this value. I mean, en dot xm. And if the sign is positive, let us change the weight or increment the weight by a positive amount. If this sign is negative, let us increment or decrement the weight by a amount which is same. So in Manhattan rule or resilient propagation, people generally look at these uh, constant weight updates or they look at the sign of the weight update. So if the sign is positive, you increment the weight by a particular amount. If the sign is negative, you just decrement the weight by that particular amount. So to do that, what people do is they apply a pulse of fixed width and duration, and that changes the conductance value or the weight value by a particular amount. And how we apply these pulses? So instead of applying a V-right, what we do is we kind of divide it into two. Let's say I have to increment these weights, which are represented by positive. So what I'll do is I'll apply a VW plus, plus on that. And how I apply it? I kind of apply this VW by two on the column, and then I apply minus VW by two on those rows. So the effective R ramps denoted by these circles see a voltage which is VW by 2 minus minus VW by 2 and that is equals to VW. However, the other cells which are here, which are not, which do not need to be potentiated or which do not need to be, uh, like whose conductance may not be increased, they only see a voltage which is equal to VW by 2, which does not disturb its resistance state, present resistance state. Now the problem is, as I told you that if you are, even if you apply the same voltage on all these RM devices, the conductance change won't be the same. Just because this conductive filament is like dissolution or even you know formation of the filament is not a very uh, controlled process, no matter how well you fabricate these devices, you apply the same voltage to all these devices, the conductance could change by different amount in different devices. And that is precisely one of the reasons why we, won't ha we haven't been able to achieve very high accuracy on today's hardware neural networks. Now this was kind of fixed amplitude training. We can also have a variable amplitude training. We kind of, where we kind of precisely calculate this value of product between the error and the inputs, and then change the weight or the conductance value proportionally to this calculated uh, value. So how we do that? We first calculate the error in the peripheral circuitry. We also calculate the product of this error and XN in the peripheral circuitry, or that is even not needed. Uh, if you utilize something which is shown in this uh, kind of slide. So what you do is you just encode the voltages that you're applying on the two ends as log of inputs and log of errors. So you just calculate this error in the peripheral circuitry, then apply the voltages proportional to log of inputs and log of error at the two ends. Now, how that works is, let's say we have to kind of, you know, apply a voltage to this RAM over here. So we apply a log of X1, where X1 is the input as the voltage here, and we apply a minus log of E1, where E1 is the error for this kind of weight, on this column. So the effective voltage seen by this kind of device is Vx minus this Ve, which is log of x1 minus minus of log E1. Now log x1 plus log E1 is nothing but log of x plus, like it's nothing but log of x times E. And if your uh, conductance of your RM is kind of having exponential dependence on the voltage across it, then just by ensuring that you're uh, encoding these weights or encoding these errors and inputs in logarithmic value, you can ensure that your conductance change is proportional to your x times e. So you had this encoded as log of x1, you had encoded this as minus log of e1, so the effective voltage was log x plus log of e, which ind indirectly becomes log of x times e. Now, RMs have this property that their conductance is kind of, or change in conduction is kind of exponentially degraded on the voltage. So you have this del g as like proportional to exponential of this log of xe and which at the end of the day becomes x times e which is precisely what you calculated over here so you can also change the amplitude or the change in the conductance proportionally to the 
value of error multiplied by this xm so that is also something that you can do just by encoding you know your voltages proportional to the log of inputs and errors so we performed several simulations on this and what we found out was that the accuracy of uh, the training accelerators or the uh, like on MNIST data set and even CIFAR data set. So CIFAR, I have reported on the results of uh, MNIST data set. So on MNIST data set, if you train your neural networks using XC2 training, that is you only train your networks on software, then the accuracy is 98.43. If you train them using Manhattan on the hardware, Manhattan rule simply means you are changing the conductance by a fixed amount just by looking at the sign of this thing. So that way, the accuracy will be great definitely, but you still get an accuracy which is close to 98.02%. And if you use this kind of variable amplitude training, then the accuracy kind of increases to 98.53. So variable amplitude training is kind of even better as compared to XC2 training. So this was all about you know, your training of uh, hardware neural networks. So to conclude, this field is evolving very rapidly. So it has got something for everyone, for device designers, circuit designers, system architects, even for algorithm developers. So we need, in terms of devices or at the abstraction level of devices, we need new memory devices with high endurance, less variability, less non-linearity. We also need this uh, circuit designs, which can kind of you know exploit these unique characteristics of these devices for several applications. Then we need architectures which share these circuits uh, as their VMM kernels. We also need algorithms for hardware friendly training and you know processing of these neural networks on hardware. And the most typical problem that we have in this kind of devices is that you know the current accuracy is very low on large data sets, such as MNIST or CIFAR, as you also saw that it was 81.02 for a very crude kind of a uh, tra training set. For MNIST and CIFAR, it's still 98%, but you know it's very low as compared to your uh, state of the art things which have gone beyond 99.6%. So it is perceived as a very poor classifier within the ML community. And that is typically the perception that if you are implementing this uh, neural networks on your hardware, you gain in terms of energy, but you lose in terms of your accuracy. So there is this trade-off which people have uh, demonstrated. And the, at the end of the day, what is our target is to achieve something which is as energy efficient as human brain, that is exaflops processor or having an energy efficiency of 10 power 6 terops per joule. So with that, I would conclude my talk. Thanks for boggling your neurons and synapses with this kind of uh, lecture. Any questions, feedbacks, and suggestions would be highly appreciated. And you can also email me on sahai.itq.ac.in. Uh, with that, I'll kind of open the floor for any questions from the participants. So, anyone with any question? Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yeah, hello. Yes, sir. I'm actually working on the devices, so I just want to know uh, mm -hmm. on the device point of view, which property should be affect or the performance of this neural network? I think. Uh, so, what kind of devices are you working on, sir? FinFed. Okay, so FinFed. See, uh, the thing is. Those would be kind of digital implementations if you're doing it using FinFET because these FED devices or MOSFETs are not memory devices, right? And as I told you that, you know, if you have to work around these, uh, uh, work around these cross point memory arrays, so you'll have to have something which shows adjustable conductance, which your FinFET show, but it also needs to have some memory or it can also retain that value. So that way, FinFETs can't be used for that cross point array. But if you want to go ahead and do some digital ASIC implementation of neuromorphic computing prim uh, like primitives using FinFRITS, then as for any other digital uh, design, the most common or the most important factors would be, you know, it's uh, uh, static leakage, which is kind of the dominant participation mode nowadays, even for your digital neuromorphic ICs. So the static leakage would be something. And parasitics, you know, for FinFRITS, parasitics is really high. So glitches and all would be like glitches and all would be larger uh, if you implement anything using FinFETs. Uh, sir, so uh, the first diagram which you have shown one T one R type of register. Mm -hmm. So so that transistor is a specific type of transistor. Or it's a normal MOSFET type of transistor. So it can be a MOSFET. It can be a specific kind of transistor as well. So mostly people started using MOSFET for that. 
but then depending upon the properties of your rram so for instance your uh, rram can also be bipolar it can also work with positive side of voltages and negative side of voltages however you know that mosfets are not bipolar so mosfets won't work with negative voltages so then they changed uh, their selector device to tfets which could have a ambipolar behavior as well so depending upon the characteristics of the rram you can have several selector devices so you can have even finfets there so if you are talking in terms of selector device so the selector device also should have the following properties first the selector device should be you know uh, it should also show you a very low static leakage the second part which i would say is its controllability or gate controllability should be very high because you are going for selectors only to you know precisely tune your current through the rm with the help of its gate electrode so gate controllability should also be very high thank you Uh, any other queries? Hello. Yeah. Uh, sir, in short channel bias problems like in FinFET, then how do you uh, connect the training uh, basis basics for neuromorphic computing in hardware aware in situ training uh, variable amplitude training? So in uh, neurons uh, will be generated in what panel in short channel effect in fact 40 nanometer model. Uh, so as I told you that these finfets cannot be used for uh, kind of since these finfets do not have any memory they cannot retain the data for a long time so they cannot be used you know in terms of the memory element they can be used in terms of selector device. So selector devices have a different property and the memory or the computation is still being performed by those memory devices, which were RAMs in this case. So what exactly is your question that way? I mean, uh, can you just repeat it once more? Ch short channel length modulation problems, uh, like uh, equations, like EDA tool is at, uh, yesterday I had told uh, Yogesh sir, uh, area tools and uh, for device thing fit, uh, thing fitting. Then, uh, how you architecture for uh, neuromorphic computing, BMM kernels and circuit designs? So, uh, neurons, uh, so you connect uh, what panels? I uh, think fit through fit. You, so you, you, you told ions, I think. Yes, okay, okay, okay. okay. These are positive and negative, and both in this. Uh, no, there are vacancies. I mean, uh, there would be only one kind of vacancies in that uh, oxide. In threshold voltage roll off, uh, very uh, very log tool A is used in neuromorphic in, in neuromorphic computing problems. Uh, see, neuromorphic computing is a very big field. Uh, what I was trying to tell you was one kind of device application of one kind of device, which is RAM, for mapping these neural networks onto your hardware. So for FinFET based neuromorphic computing, you will have to look at, you know, the CAM structures and all, and that would be a digital design. So, and if you're talking about this uh, threshold voltage roll off or, you know, this short channel effects, so short channel effects will definitely increase your uh, leakage current. And if your leakage current is increasing, definitely the power and all that you can, uh, energy efficiency of those neuromorphic computing systems, which you make with FinFETs, that will definitely degrade. And I won't say that uh, those will be very promising for neuromorphic computing. Okay, okay, sir. <clears throat> so uh, there's this question: Where does ferroelectric material fit in? So these ferroelectric materials are another class of memories. So as I told you about RAM, so these ferroelectric materials, so those RAMs are, you know, uh, there are flavors of RAMs which are CMOS compatible, but they do not exhibit a very high uh, difference between the maximum and minimum conductance state. So uh, these ferroelectric materials, on the other hand, they are a very mature technology. And with the advent of this HFOX based ferroelectric materials, so uh, you can even replace these uh, RAMs with the help of these ferroelectric materials. And you can even partially program these uh, ferroelectric materials. So as I was talking about the resistance or the conductive filament in RAMs, the kind of tunable knob that you have in ferroelectric is the kind of partial polarization. It's the partial polarization of uh, these uh, ferroelectric domains inside your uh, insulator, like HF, HZO or any uh, HFOX based ferroelectric. So just by partially changing the polarization of each of these uh, different domains, 
you can kind of have a uh, shift in the threshold voltage of this ferroelectric fits, which kind of gives you a, a conductance state, which is different. And that is how you can kind of change or replace these RMs even with ferroelectric fits. And since they are, uh, you know, uh, more kind of uh, CMOS compatible, it's all the more better or they're preferable over RMs. Yeah. Hello, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Sir, can you just briefly tell us about the hardware security part of your lab? What exactly mean that? What are the other So hardware security, what we do is, so I told you that in each cycle, you apply the same voltage, but you are getting a different output in each cycle. So typically what that gives you is, that gives you a kind of random number. And there are many applications such as cryptography for secure communication, where you need to generate these random numbers, for instance, your OTP and all. So precisely we can target those applications by exploiting these variabilities. And also apart from this, there is another security primitive, which is known as a physical uncontrollable function. So each of these dice or each of these device on an array will show you a unique property. And if you kind of separate these devices and kind of put this into different commercial devices, just by applying the same voltage in each of those commercial devices and looking at the results, you can identify which kind of chip was inserted in which kind of device. So that way it also serves the process of that identification and authentication. So there are these two security primitives that we work on. Thank you, sir. So uh, then the question is which memory store model such as Ion Siemens barrier model is best to implement in cross battery. So these memory store models that you're talking about like Ion Siemens model or even the HP memory store model, they are very crude models. So the worst part about this field is different material stacks show different transport property in our RAMs. So there's no single model which kind of, uh, kind of fits all these characteristics. So what people use is they kind of come up with their own behavioral compact models. So most of these behavioral compact models are not physics based. They just look at the static characteristics, the dynamic characteristics and the variations. And then they just come up with certain equations which fit those uh, kind of characteristics with minimum number of, uh, what should I say, parameters. So that is how, uh, that is uh, how, how we are like, you know, uh, that is how the community has been thriving. So in terms of which memory store model is best to implement in crossbar array, depending upon the material stack, whatever material or whatever device you are working with, choose the memory store model, which fits that characteristics. And that is, that is what I will say regarding this. So there's nothing which is best, different, uh, different kind of memory stacks will have different model, which are best fitting them. So you have to choose it appropriately. Another question is uh, non one human architecture is possible? Yes. So inherently these are all non one human architecture because this cross point area, as you saw, if you kind of encode your inputs in terms of voltages and your weights in terms of these conductances, you're kind of performing this vector by matrix multiplication then and there itself. You are not kind of, you know, going ahead and uh, then uh, extracting values of uh, the data from some memory location and then performing computation somewhere else. Everything was being done on that same crossbar array. So inherently these are all non one human architecture and that is possible. So any other question? Uh, sir, am I audible? Yeah, yeah you're audible. Uh, yes, sir. The crossbar structure you were talking about at the end, mm -hmm. is it one T one R crossbar structure or just a R crossbar structure? So I talked about two flavors. So uh, what I showed or what I was kind of discussing while implementing those neural networks on hardware, that was zero T1R or a simple 1R passive crossbar array. But there is also a feasibility of this 1T1R crossbar array, which HP or University of Michigan have been looking at or they have been working with. So what I told you or what I showed you was a zero T1R or a 1R passive crossbar array, which I used to work at UCSB. But there can be other uh, flavors as well, like 1T1R, which I discussed. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, any other query? Uh, any other feedback, queries, suggestions, anything from the audience? Hello? Yeah. Uh, sir, uh... Advanced Python uh, as well as uh, machine learning will be used in neuromorphic computing. Yes. Yes. Okay. So the best part is you do not need to write any code from scratch in this field. There are already several repositories available on GitHub. You just need to take the codes from there 
and then you just acknowledge them in your paper and then you run it so machine learning community the best part about this community is that you know uh, you don't need to kind of write any code from scratch there are several codes which are available take these codes run it on your system modify it according to your own needs and that is that is that is how it works okay. and even you know you see some new paper in cvpr or any other conference you just mail those authors they'll definitely send their codes so this this way this community is very transparent and it's really good to work with them Uh, any other last queries? Okay, if there are no uh, no significant queries or no queries, then I'll just end the session over here. Thank you so much for being a good audience. Okay, have a nice day. Bye.